I can, I will uh, say something that I said this morning that I saw that raised some, uh, some reaction among the people, which was a very strong claim, and I'm curious to hear Chris' opinion, so maybe we will find out whether we are in complete disagreement or mm -hmm. where there is a fundamental reality that we share. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just a matter. So the, 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 the claim that I made this morning is that information does not exist is that uh, information as it is used by uh, computer scientists uh, or neuroscientists, uh, in, uh, at least in uh, uh, scientific popular um, papers, but also in many um, official papers, is essentially a, 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 an epistemic uh, entity, fictitious entities like centers of mass or meridians. Something that it is very useful to explain, to, to describe, something that is very useful to describe what it happens, but something that refers to, to a much uh, more complex state of, of things. So my point is, just, just to make an example, I made it before uh, during lunch. If I asked you, is there any information here on the, on the table, let's suppose that I take out everything, is there any information here? You may say yes or no, but my point is that there might be information if I had a previous agreement with Chris, for example, that if I didn't put anything on the table, that means that uh, I want to do something. If I put, say, my key on the table, it means that I want to leave sooner, or something like that. So there may be an agreement about the state of the mm -hmm. table. Mm -hmm. But just by checking the table, there's no way we can know whether there is information on the table. Because in order to know whether there is information on the table, we need to know if there is any agreement about that state of things, which is whether the table is, is empty or not. So I think that the same holds for computers, holds for many situations in which we refer to information to refer to some kind of agreement or, let's say, to a more complex state of things. So in this sense, I think that information does not exist. What do you think, Chris? Does it make okay. sense? Or are you <laughs> okay, that's, that's a very nice starting point. Uh, because as, as um, many of you probably know, um, there's an entire movement within physics which claims that information is all that exists. And um, for example, over the past roughly 20 years, quantum theory has been completely reformulated as purely a theory of information. And uh, the, the proponents, uh, the more radical proponents of this way of, of thinking about physics claim that uh, information is all there is. There's no stuff of any kind. Uh, it's all just information. So, uh, when I listened to your talk this morning, you uh, talked about the states of uh, objects. So, for example, the velocity of a Ferrari as being only defined uh, with respect to uh, some other object. So the Ferrari going at 160 with respect to the ground is only going at 60 with respect to me if I'm, if I'm driving 100. So in that case, um, the property of velocity is seen as a, as a strictly relational property between one thing, uh, me and my car, <laughs> and something else, which is the Ferrari that's speeding by me. And when we describe the situation like that, um, as you did in your talk, um, and think about it with kind of our straightforward intuitions, 
then the relationship of velocity, that in this case is 60 kilometers an hour, is a relationship between two things that we're just assuming exist independently. And so I'll, I'll, in a sense, reformulate your question as uh, we can ask about whether there's any information on the table, but we can also ask about whether the table itself uh, is uh, an entity that exists in a completely observer-independent way. What does that mean? What does it mean to say that the table exists in a completely observer-independent way? Um, from the point of view of a, of, a, of a physicist, observation is just interaction. Uh, observation is the trading of energy for information. Uh, energy and information are two different ways of describing exactly the same currency. And if you think that way, then if you ask, does the table exist in an observation independent way, which was the assumption of classical physics after all, that the whole world exists in a way that's completely independent of its ever being observed. Uh, Einstein was flabbergasted by quantum theory, and at one point he said to Abraham Pais, do they really mean that the moon isn't there if no one's looking at it? And the answer is yes, that's exactly what we mean. <laughs> the moon isn't there if no one's looking at it. But, but think about what it means to observe. To observe is just to interact. So the postulate of an observer-dependent reality is the postulate of an interaction-independent reality. <laughs> so to ask the question, is the table there if no one looks, never mind the information, is to ask the question, is the table there if nothing's interacting with it at all? <laughs> but if nothing's interacting with it at all, it can't possibly be part of the physical world because the physical world is just a network of interaction. So I would, I would go back to your, to, your, to your question by saying, there's no such thing as a table <laughs> independent of interaction. Right. And so there's no such thing as a table independent of observation. So there's no such thing as a table independent of a communication, as you put it. Communication is just interaction uh, between some system that we call an observer, maybe that's me or you, uh, or you, and some other system that we choose to call a table. But if those systems aren't interacting, neither of them exist, because nothing, nothing exists without interaction. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> that's very much in, in the same direction in which I'm going, a purely relational or interactionist view of reality. And I think this is uh, coherent with uh, science, as you mentioned, because in science, all physical properties are defined as the outcome of a measurement, and the measurement is an interaction. So we don't know whether a particle has any mass when there are no other masses around. We don't know whether a particle has any electric charge when there are no elect other electric charges around. Mm -hmm. Because all that we know is that when we have two electrons, they interact together. Mm -hmm. But an electron, an isolated, an isolated electron, would it would have any uh, electric charge? We cannot make an experiment to show that it has. So science presents us with a picture of a reality that is fundamentally relational, and it is. Uh, so a reality is fundamental, something that comes into existence because of interaction. This is not the same as saying that reality is depending on observation, because it is true that all observations are interaction, but it is not true that all interactions are observations. Mm -hmm. So we could have a broader view of reality, an interactionist view of reality, where there are some interactions that are not supported by observers, 
but still are sufficient to keep reality uh, in existence, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I wanted to mention is that here there is some confusion about the word, not, not in your reply, but in the literature, about the word information. Because it's a, a word that we use in many different contexts and probably with uh, a very different meaning. So one thing is the information that I refer in a computer. One thing is the information at the quantum uh, scale mm -hmm. in quantum process. So when physicists said that probably ener matter and energy are just are not the fundamental stuff, but there is a more fundamental stuff that they could call it information, they're not referring to something like the information we have in our pen drive on, or in our cell phone. Because our cell phone can be completely described in a Newtonian framework, mm -hmm. according to classical physics. And everything they do, everything we do with our machine, so far can be uh, quite well described by classical physics. So they use the word information in two completely different contexts. Context. In one, they want to address a fu some still unknown fundamental layer of reality. In the other one, they are using traditional Shannon and Weaver information theory to describe the interaction between discrete mechanisms, like mm -hmm. your cell phone and my cell phone. Mm -hmm. uh, the third point, and then I, 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 I will stop here. At the very beginning of the, the um, Western philosophy, in one of Plato's dialogue, I'm sorry to say, there is a strange character that is uh, um, unknown, he is completely uh, is unnamed. Usually all the characters in Plato's dialogue are historical philosophers, <laughs> Parmenides, Socrates, and so forth. <laughs> but there is one of them that is not presented with his name, so he's uh, unknown. He's called the foreigner. <laughs> The foreigner, it appears in the dialogue called the sophist. The foreigner is an unnamed philosopher that claims against Plato the idea that everything exists because it is in relation with something else. In two, it is in Plato in, at the, in the line 242b. So <laughs> it's a very famous passage. In this dialogue, this uh, philosopher coming from Ilia, a town here in Italy, claims that everything exists only insofar is in relation with something else. No matter how much, no matter how little, but it has to be in relation. So he presents a view of reality that is intrinsically relational, intrinsically related with uh, a causal um, relation. He has causal relation in mind. And in philosophy, this kind of view is called the Eleatic Principle, because it has been suggested by a philosopher coming from Ilia, this mm -hmm. town in Italy. And physics, I think, and I'm curious that, that I wanted to end with a question, I think that physics is going in that direction. So we moved from, a, a, let's say, a classical physics in which all physical properties were absolute and objective in the sense of being completely independent of being measured or being in relation with something else to a view of reality in which, like in the collapse of the wave function, things are different based on the way in which they interact with the um, rest of the universe. So my question is, is science and physics moving having a broad trajectory from an absolute view of reality to a relational view of reality? Well, I think large parts of physics clearly are. And um, the work of, of Carlo Rovelli uh, is, is one of, was one of the pioneers of this new view. Um, he published his relational interpretation of quantum theory three decades ago, I think and has pursued that since. But I, I would also say, going back to your, your original example of the Ferrari, okay. that the, the view is, is more radical than the view that follows from our common intuitions, um, in that 
it makes the relationships between objects, in a sense, definitional. So if we think of the, the Ferrari and me um, traveling on the highway, our ordinary intuition is that uh, the relationship of velocity is a relationship between these two entities that exist independently. But as physics has become more relational, um, it has increasingly viewed the relationships as the definitional features of the entities and as, moreover, the only definitional features of the, of the entities. So when, um, so in, if you view the relationship as definitional, it means that uh, the, the relative velocity between the Ferrari and me is part of the definition of the Ferrari. And without that relationship, that Ferrari doesn't exist. And the relationship is perfectly symmetric. So the relationship between me and the Ferrari is also part of the definition of me. <laughs> So without the Ferrari, I don't exist. And, and we can take this very naturally to your comment about the electron existing in, the free electron existing in space with no charges around it. Uh, if there, there is no way for that electron to interact with anything, then it doesn't exist. Uh, it, it is not an entity uh, because there, there are no interaction independent entities. So without inter so interaction is, is definitional of entities. And I think this comports well with your picture because when you talk about um, my awareness of the glass is the glass, <laughs> Uh, I am the glass that I am aware of, or I am more broadly the world that I am aware of. My world is defined by a set of, of relationships uh, between, and you made a referential reference to the body, so between my body and that and that and that and that and that. That's what defines my world, those relationships the world that I am. But note that all of these relationships also define the reference point of the body. So without this network of, of interactions, my body doesn't exist at all. My body is not an observation or interaction independent entity, and nothing else is either. So the, the world as I see it, within your description of consciousness is a network of relationships without any <laughs> relationship independent objects. Yeah, I think using a not completely precise metaphor that we are moving from a world in which there were entities like atoms having relationship between them to a world where we have relation and we call certain aggregates of relation atoms. So once mm -hmm. relation were outside of the basic entity of reality, now relation are inside, are the stuff reality is made of. Um, having said that, another thing that I was thinking about is, uh, you all know the picture of the Vitruvian man, <laughs> this body that with, the, with the arms. Uh, I, I've been in the Emirates last, for, for a semester, and once I showed the um, picture of the Vitruvian man, and someone said to me, no, no, take, a, take it away, take it away. Why, why, it's naked, it's naked. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot show a naked man here. <laughs> so anyway, in this picture we have this uh, figure of the man, and they had one of the idea behind this very platonistic uh, mm -hmm. uh, picture, so I, I shouldn't mention it <laughs> for that reason, was twofold. One idea was that this body had inside itself all the right proportions. 
and proportion are relation in mathematics. Right. So the head was one seventh of the body, the arms were the same length of the, the legs, and so forth. So it made a circle. So the idea that the human body had inside itself all the necessary relation of the universe. Mm -hmm. And the body, in that case, was a metaphor for man. But I take the body more uh, at face value than, than, than Leonardo did. So for me, it's not a metaphor. It, it's just the body. But it also meant another thing, that the world we are familiar with is, in a way, um, a projection of the relation of the ratios inside the human body. And if you think about that, the world we live in, the world made of uh, the blue of the sky, the clouds, everything, is what it is because our body is what it is. So for us, it seems normal that the world we live in is without uh, bosons, mesons, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, um, infrared, ultrawave, and all kinds of stuff. But this is the outcome. This is an offshoot of the fact that our body is built in a certain way. So the world that surrounds us is, in a way, a projection a negative projection of the way in which our body is built. If our body were different, the world we live in would be utterly different, mm -hmm. would be filled with other kind of particles, other kind of physical phenomena. Mm -hmm. It would be a completely alien world. We think that if an alien were here on the Earth, walking with us, he would be in the same world. He would see the blue of the sky, he would see the mountains like mm -hmm. we see them, and so forth. But the alien, if we're here, because he uh, would have a completely different body, he would, see a completely, he would see a completely different Tuscany, he would see a completely different mm -hmm. Titignano. So, that is strange, but when we look at Titignano, in a way, we see a negative projection of our body. We see Titignano as Titignano may, to use a metaphor from quantum physics, may collapse because of the interaction offered by our body. And that it is interesting, I think, because usually we think that the world is what it is, mm -hmm. and we are just inside this world that it is independent of our presence in Titignano. But Titignano is completely different because we are here. When we are not here, who knows what is Titignano? It's surely different. Yeah. And uh, well, I may think, I say something here? Yes, yes, please. I think you've you've beautifully described the the concept of Umwelt right. that was put forward by uh, Jakob van van Uschke, uh, in the 1920s. He was a biologist, and he was a very sensitive uh, and extremely observant natural historian. And his question was, how do other organisms see the world? We see the world in, in the way we see the world, but how does a fly see the world? How does a slug see the world? How does a tree see the world? How does a fish see the world? And von Uchtel's contribution to, to the language, the Umwelt, was the world of that particular perceiver. <laughs> uh, and he wrote, wrote beautiful, uh, what? A stroll the, to the, the world of men. Of, and of animals and men. Animals and a, men. A, lo a lovely book. A great I remember book. reading it long ago. But it seems to me that you're capturing this, this very kind of concept of the, the, the personal Umwelt, right. not just for an individual, uh, or a group of individuals, but for a species, or even a type of species. Yeah, and um, although there, there was, yes, I do agree. I mean, I, I'm a big lover of uh, von Wechsel's uh, Umwelt, notion of the Umwelt. 
The difference is that uh, for von Uexu, all the properties are already there. Yes. Are absolute. I agree. Well, in this yeah. case, they come into existence when yeah. they can interact with the world. Yeah, von Oeschel didn't have this relational view no, of the world. No, but he was very close. He was, uh, yeah. had a great insight. And um, so it is interesting to think that uh, the world we see, another metaphor, is offered by photography. I always ask to my student, what is the difference between a statue, a very realistic uh, statue, even with colors, like a, a wax statue mm -hmm. made of wax, and uh, a, a, a portrait made in a, a using a perspective, perspectival portrait, mm -hmm. or a photograph. What is the difference? Yes, of course, one is flat, the other one is uh, three-dimensional. But there's another difference. That if I take a sculpture, if I make a sculpture of Chris, you don't know where I was when I took the sculpture of Chris. You have no idea where I was when I, when I, when I sculpted the, the sculpture or from which way I, I saw Chris. Mm -hmm. You have, when you see the Michelangelo's Pietà, you have no idea where was Michelangelo, what was Michelangelo's viewpoint. But when you see a picture, there is something more in that picture. Mm -hmm. There is the viewpoint. There is the perspective from which that picture had been taken. So the world, in a way, is closer to a photograph than to a sculpture. Mm -hmm. The world we live in contains us. The world we live in contains our body. It is there, it's everywhere. It is in the shade of the colors that I'm, that I'm able to see and therefore that I, put, that I, I single out in the world. It is uh, in the choice of the, the, the sizes of, of things. It is everything. The world I live in, it has been sculpted, it has been produced by the interaction with my body. Mm -hmm. So, once we see that, we may begin to understand why it is not so strange to think that we are that world. Because that world is the offshoot of our body. So, it is true that it is in space and time located elsewhere than where and when our body is. But it is also true that it is the, 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 the outcome of our body. So it is us. Where are we? We are there. Because that is the thing, is the world that is produced by our body. So it's more intimate. That, that, that was the word that I was looking mm -hmm. for. The external world we see, we perceive, it's not really an objective world a world that exists absolutely independently of us. It is an intimate world. Only it is not physically inside our body, also because our body is already filled with other organs that do <laughs> what they need to do, which is a completely different thing than producing a copy of the external world. Well, I think that that comment leads beautifully into uh, a question that I, I think is very deep for, for your approach and is also uh, very deep within physics, which is the question of what it means for multiple observers to share a single world. What, what, what does it mean to say that multiple observers can observe the same object. So it certainly looks as if Ricardo and I are both observing this bottle. <laughs> but if we take this, this picture completely seriously, then uh, there's, there's my bottle that's part of my world that's defined by a relationship between this and that and this and some other things. And then there's Ricardo's bottle that's part of Ricardo's world that's defined by a relationship between this and that and that and a bunch of other things. 
So in a sense, they're, they're two entirely different bottles. <laughs> but if we're going to have an interaction as we're having right now, it's obviously possible for us to share <laughs> uh, a bottle because we can sit here and talk about it. And all of you can see that we're doing that. Um, but the question is how to describe in a completely self-consistent way uh, the fact that we can share this object <laughs> as an object of discourse uh, or, in, or in more physics-y language as an object of observation. So, for example, I can manipulate the bottle and, and you can observe the results of my manipulation. So I'm not doing something private here, even though I'm interacting in my own little world. Right? Uh, and similar, you can do the same thing. Uh, so we have to be able to say exactly what it means that uh, there can be an object that's defined with respect to me and defined with respect to you, and of course we're defined with respect to each other, uh, that we can share. Right. Well, I think that a, a relational view suggests a completely different picture of communication from the one that it is usually uh, presented since Shannon's time. Mm -hmm. Since Shannon's time, we have this notion that to communicate is to exchange packets of bits with no meaning at all. Because according to Shannon, information doesn't contain any meaning. Mm -hmm. It is meaningless. And it is not by chance that this notion, this Shannon's notion has been developed in the Second World War. Also in uh, cooperation, well, not, not personally, but uh, it was the same community with other people like Alan Turing and other people that were involved into the war efforts mm -hmm. and in war you don't want to send to broadcast the meaning of your communication so if you see the movie the the the, um, the about the enigma machine the imitation game the imitation game you see that they have the problem to encode and decode encrypted messages so the the meaning was the 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 the, the people tried to put as little meaning as possible in their messages because they don't want other people to understand the meaning of those messages. So that was the model from which our current understanding of communication, uh, that was the world from which our current understanding of communication came from, mm -hmm. a world in which information is just completely devoid of meaning. Mm -hmm. And then you have your own criterion for decoding that information, and I have my own criterion to decode and code them. Mm -hmm. And of, in this way, it, it is a little bit of uh, warlike communication. We are like tanks, we are like submarines, and we exchange information, but who knows whether it reaches the, the, the other guy. So we hope that. In an interaction, and that produces many problems. For example, is it possible to communicate the feeling I have when I see a color? No, it's not possible, unless the other guy has had an experience with the same physical property. So if, if I had to communicate to a congenitally blind subject the experience of seeing red, it would be utterly impossible because I, I could not succeed in pointing out at anything in their experience, in the congenitally blind subject experience. And there is nothing in our language that allows us, can, can women explain to men what does it mean to have pregnancy just by using words? No, of course not, because we never had that experience, and so forth. There are many other examples that we can make. As long as we don't share the same body, or we lack some critical part of the body, we are not able to communicate to the other guy, so, or to the other woman. So, language is not able to communicate a lot. There's some mm -hmm. boundary there. But an interactionist view of reality suggests a completely different picture of communication. Communication means to overlap. Because we are no longer inside our body, we are no longer submarines, mm -hmm. we are no longer uh, tanks sending uh, encrypted messages that have to be decoded, mm -hmm. but we are two bodies different, but at the same time in the same world. Mm -hmm. So we find our uh, connection not in the privacy of our mental inner world, 
but we find our connection, we succeed in doing communication when our world handshake, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. When your world, for a moment, is made by the same things my world is made of. That's why I think many times we find out that to achieve true communication, we need to live together, to eat together, to walk together, to dance mm -hmm. together, to dance together, to do things together, because that's a way to make our worlds that are no longer inner worlds, that's a way to make our worlds overlap. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, um, a few times, uh, some times ago, I've been asked to make a talk on communication, and I started with two slides. In one slide, there was the orthodox view. The two people are staring at each other, and they're sending messages. That's the orthodox view. In the second slide, there were two people watching both in the same direction, but not at each other. They were watching the same thing. And that's, in my view, is true communication, is to perceive the same world and therefore to be made of the same stuff, mm -hmm. which is uh, different than from having the same meaning in two private inner mental worlds. I, I think it is interesting. It, it, it suggests a much more ecological, much more social understanding of communication. Much more social and, and also much more physical. Much in more a sense. physical. Yeah. And I, I, it's worth pointing out in the, the since you brought up cryptography, yeah. that the, the two submarines are able to communicate only if sometime beforehand, yeah. you know, I gave you my one-time pad, right. right? So I had to give you a physical object. We had to share a physical object. Right, before. Before we could right. communicate. And that's that notion that I have to give you a physical object before we can communicate. Uh, represents one of the, in a sense, one of the central problems in quantum theory, is, which is how do you define the reference frames that are shared between observers? Right. And if I may make a follow-up on this point, uh, once again in Plato, <laughs> <laughs> in the, the origin of philosophy, when they started to address this very problem, mm -hmm. and the very, in a way, in a few dialogues, the problem of communication, and they had the same problem. How can we achieve communication if we haven't exchanged before hand something? Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why Plato introduces the notion of innate ideas. Yeah. Because innate ideas are the thing that we share before starting to talk. And they are needed for Plato. Because otherwise, if we live in our private inner world, mental world, we could not achieve communication. So the only solution is that we exchange that thing, not before, but you say, in, the, in an innate world. Yeah. Uh, just uh, uh, as, uh, and then we are getting to the end, but I wanted to make an example that I found very, very, very striking of the way in which the world is the, the, the expression of our body and not, and not um, something, the rainbow, the rainbow. When mm. we watch a rainbow, we see the rainbow as made of uh, different bands, different arches. We see the red, the, orange, the yellow, the, the cyan, the green. We see it, uh, a discontinuous rainbow. In fact, when we draw a rainbow, when the Pink Floyd made the dark side of the moon cover, they put different stripes of color because that's the way in which we see the rainbow. According to light, uh, the frequency, Changes in a completely. Oh my God! <laughs> According to light, the uh, the frequency of light changes in a completely continuous way, mm. from red to violet. Mm -hmm. So those stripes are not there. But when we see the rainbow, we see the stripes of the rainbow there, mm -hmm. and they are not there. The rainbow is just a, a, a macroscopic example, but everything is like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. This table is like that. <laughs> All of you are like that. <laughs> uh, 
the, 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 the divisions are our overlay that defines our world in terms of, if you will, relationships that we can comprehend. And we're not all that good at comprehending relationships. So we have to, we have to deal cognitively with fairly simple relationships. And the way to make the relationship simple is to cut things up into pieces right. instead of trying to, to deal with these completely interconnected, interacting whole entities. Women are better in understanding relationship. <laughs> <laughs> or, or men are worse. <laughs> So do you want to, to open this up for questions? Yeah. Any questions? I, I still, oh, I, I, have, I have a comment. I would like to find somebody who does, I don't believe in this stuff that I'm saying, but I would like somebody who does life regression to know your problem with Plato. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is something deep there. I don't know right. what it is. It's, it's because Ricardo is actually a reincarnation of Heraclitus. <laughs> That's what I thought. Or the guy, the foreign, the foreign from Italy. I know. <laughs> like, you're Maybe. busted. <laughs> there are question here. Thank you. It seems you go very far from the reality I live in. And I will go back to what you said this morning, Monsieur Ricardo. You said that all is relative. It's not. Uh, velocity is relative. But Einstein also showed that space-time is absolute. And we have to deal with that. And you, Chris, take in this discussion. I think it was with Einstein and Bohr. But Einstein said, do you really, me really mean that the moon doesn't exist when I don't see it? And Bohr said, how could you know that it does exist when you don't see it? Of course he's right. But you always forgot, how could we know that it doesn't exist? <laughs> it seems to not be an observational thing. It seems to be a way to choose our world view. And I don't think, taking Plato, we have a, you must have a theory which is good. It's not good to say that the reality is that like way. Because we, the, then we could say, the war in Syria doesn't exist. We can sit here be very happy, but Vera said to last night, I will not be free when not all are free. So I think this relative word you're talking about, I don't like it at all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Einstein clearly didn't like it either. Yeah. No. But I, the, the, the history of, of, of physics, at least recently, uh, is a, a very concerted movement to, to get rid of space-time altogether and make it completely emergent from quantum theory. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. It's a, it's a very interesting, it's kind of the intellectual challenge for physics in these few decades to see if space-time can be made to disappear. Yeah. Well, a follow-up. Uh, relative in this sense, though, is not arbitrary, is not subjective. Mm. So when uh, we say that the Ferrari has a relative velocity, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a definite velocity. It has a very definite and, in a way, absolute relative velocity relative to my car. So when, I, when, I, when two cars hit against each other, the damage they do is perfectly fixed by the relative velocity. So relative is not arbitrary. I yeah. just wanted to make clear this point. Right. Well, notice that the, the collision is itself a measurement of a particularly yes. gruesome Pretty. kind, but yeah. <laughs> it does give you an answer. <laughs> it gives us an answer, exactly. One, if there is one more question, otherwise we do some closing. Do you guys want to close with some challenging statement for the universe? <laughs> <laughs> Chris. Um, well... Uh, I want to go back to this this issue of uh, how observers share a system, and I I am actually very sympathetic to to you're saying it's a matter of overlap, which is interestingly uh, like our best model of how neurons compute, <laughs> uh, basically uh, by looking for the overlap between their their excitation patterns, uh, this, this notion of overlap is ubiquitous. 
in thinking about what communication could possibly be. But I'll, I'll just close by uh, mentioning the conclusion of a, a beautiful paper by uh, a French physicist named Alexei Grinbaum that was published a couple of years ago in uh, Studies in the Philosophy of Modern Physics. And he starts out talking about the, the new movement of quantum information theory. And he asks, in this context, what is physics about? You know, it's, it's clearly no longer about stuff. Uh, it's about information, which really means it's about relationships that define the entities that they relate. But the very last statement in his paper is, uh, at, in the, at the point at which we've gotten, physics can only be about language, which is effectively to say physics can only be about communication. Good. Well, I will, yeah, I will uh, end. I will connect to that with communication. Mm. And I will make a reference with this tattoo of mine, which is the Mercury. It is not far from here. It is in Florence. It is the Mercurio di Giambologna. It is a statue of Mercury, mm. the Greek god. And uh, why did I put the Mercury? Mm -hmm. Be because one of the characterizations of Mercury is that he was the god of the multiple uh, truths. And he was opposed to Apollo. Apollo was the god of the sun, was the god of the only truth. Mm. Everything is just one way. Against this uh, monolithic view of uh, Apollo, there was Mercury. Mercury was communicating, was the god that was bringing uh, messages from one god to another god. And every time, he was changing a little bit the <laughs> meaning of the message. He never let the messages as it was originally. Because he liked it to create multiple worlds, in a way. He made, in a way, Mercury created a richer world than the one that Apollo would have liked to have. So that's why I put Mercury on, on my leg, because he's the god of the relative truth, of a relational world based on communication. And mm -hmm. on this, I do agree with the, the last word you mentioned, communication, yeah. which in the physical world is interaction. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.